Willie told me that both he and Kate felt trapped and unfairly persecuted by the press and Pa and Camilla. So I felt some need to carry the banner for all three of us in 2015, which is why I was working so hard all the time. I had to work this hard. He says, selfishly, I didn't want the press coming from me. <laughs> to be called lazy? I shuddered. I never wanted to see that word attached to my name. The press had called me stupid for most of my life and naughty and racist. But if they dared to call me lazy, well, I couldn't guarantee I was gonna go down to Fleet Street and start pulling people out from behind their desks. Okay, let's see you do it. Hello, happy Friday, it's good to see you again. Welcome to another episode of I'll Spare You the Details. We're going through Prince Harry's Spare, chapter by chapter. And in today's episode, we are going to talk all about how Harry has developed um, an inability to go outside. So he's really terrified of people and he stops going outside. We talk all about how super normal he is and that's why he always looks so sloppy. We talk about the fact that um, William uh, has zero regard for his mental health and has mocked him for his panic attacks. We talk about the return of Rehaber Kooks. If you don't remember Rehaber Kooks, I will remind you of who she is. And um, there's lots of stories about how he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know who he should be in the world. Lots of him trying on different hats. That's kind of his thing. We've seen that all the way back to his gap year when he wanted to be just like George when he was in Australia. He wanted to be like George the Jackaroo. And, you know, we've just seen that progression in his personality. So this section is again a lot of disjointed stories that are just sort of pulled together because they happen to have they happen to be at the same time in his life around tw uh, 2015 that's when this whole section happens and he's 30 and it's just really quite frankly you guys this section was super depressing to me like this this whole section of him not being able to leave the house and just I just felt kind of bad for him you know I think that this was the first time that I genuinely just felt kind of gutted over what has happened to Harry. Um, because I've said this before, I feel like the entire world has been Team Harry his whole life. I think that everyone has, has been rooting for him. Like if you paid any attention at all to the royal family, like who didn't like, who didn't like Harry? And I think that to see who he's become now and who he wants us to, to believe that he is, it's just unfortunate. That's not exactly a great way for me to get you to finish watching the video, but I, I mean, I promise it'll be worth it. It's just, I don't know, the, the last story just kind of like felt, made me feel sad. Um, and I'm sure that when Megan enters the story, it's all going to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns and gumdrop parties and all this. But for right now, it's a little bit uh, just depressing. Oh, okay. Before we start, you know, I have to say all of the things that I always say. If you're enjoying the channel, if you would give it a like, if you would hit the subscribe button, if you would hit the bell for notifications, if you would share the videos, that would be awesome. Okay, that's all I have to say on that front. Let's get back to it. Okay, so the first story he tells us, we begin again with Rehaber Kooks. Oh, dang that silly thing. Okay, hang on. Let me go take down the, the chimes. I have these wind chimes outside and they just chime and chime and chime and I forget that they're going because I'm they 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 ring all day long and so I've just blocked it out but you guys don't want to hear that so just a minute let me go take those down sorry about that I'm back okay one second let me get some coffee now okay okay back to the book all right so rehabber kooks returns now if you don't remember rehabber kooks her, she's a journalist. Her real name is Rebecca Brooks, okay? But Harry thought it was good. It's like super clever because he figured out that her name was a perfect anagram for rehab or kooks, which that, those aren't even real words. So I'm not sure how that anagram works, but he chose that because he said that she, well, she had written a whole long article about him when he'd been a teenager saying that he was a big drug addict and that he had to go to rehab and all this. And we're still not super clear about whether he did go to rehab or not because Later on, he talks about other journalists asking him questions about that time, and he's really offended that they would poke around in his private rehab business. So 
I don't understand why Rehab or Kooks writing about it was so offensive because he says it didn't happen, but then later on he doesn't um, refute that it did happen. So anyway, Rehab or Kooks is back and she had gone to court because um, of her dealings in the press that were quite nefarious. I mean, the things that she and her husband did um, and all of their, as Harry would call them, minions, the things they were up to were exceptionally um, inappropriate for a journalist to be up to. One of the things he, he claims, and I mean, again, I've probably researched this to see if it's true. He says two things that were like, ooh. Um, he says that he was really upset because she had been acquitted at trial in the whole phone hacking scandal. And he says that the thing that was so upsetting was that the evidence was really strong. I mean, everybody said so. And yet here she was getting off. And he said that the jury said that the evidence wasn't enough, but he'd like to know how it was that Rehabber Kooks' husband could be outside throwing garbage bags of computers and files and all kinds of personal belongings and thumb drives into the garbage. And the police sort of just acted like, oh, what up, you're just taking the garbage out, okay. If that's true, that's kind of jacked up. And then he said that the thing that really bothered him was that these people, Rehabber Kooks and her gang, had mucked around in people's private business to such an extent that they were even getting in the way of criminal cases. And he tells about a time when there was this girl, her name was Millie Dowler, and she was a teenager who'd been abducted and murdered. And Rehabber Kooks and her people had broken into the phone, Millie's phone, and listened to her voicemail messages. Well, when that was discovered, they didn't know who'd been listening to the messages. They thought Millie was alive and had listened to her own messages. And that gave the parents this false sense of hope that, oh, Millie's alive. Well, no, it was just the journalists breaking into her phone. So if that's true, that's super dark. And I can totally get on board with Harry's anger at a system that protected people who were doing things like that. So anyway, he's just really annoyed. He's really angry. And that sort of sets the tone for this entire section um, that he just feels like the world is super unfair and it's an unsafe place. So he's going to start, as this section progresses, just holding himself off away from the world. He keeps saying, and he has this refrain, he, he says it a couple of times in this section, did, pe did people not care? They didn't. They did not care. That's his thing. Did people care? They did not. People did not care. It's like, it's almost like something he must have played over and over in his, he in his own head, like, um, a loop that went around in, in, in his head, just this really negative mantra that he would say to himself as he was going through the world. Um, he says his faith in the whole system took a serious hit when Rehab Kooks got off scot-free. So he said he needed to reset and so he went to Africa. And he said he spent a few days with Tish and Mike after Rehab Kooks got off. And he said it helped, but then when he returned to England, he just barricaded himself in not caught and tried not to go out at all. He said that at the beginning of that year, in 2014, he went out a few times after getting back from Africa. But the thing is, is that every time he'd go out, the Paps would just destroy his life once again. And one time, do we recall Tweedledum and Tweedledummer? They came charging at him. And he says that um, one person was like grabbing at their hip as though they were trying to pull a gun out of a holster. And so he really thought that this was the end for him, that Tweedledum and Tweedledum were coming to kill him. That's a little unhinged. And he says that it turned out they didn't have a gun, but you know, they definitely freaked everybody out. So they might as well have had one. But of course he says his mantra once again, did people care? They didn't, they did not care. So there we see it again. Then he moves on to talk about a time when he had gone to London Tower. They, he, Willie, and Catherine had gone because they were there for an art installation. So the, an artist had been making all these ceramic poppies and they were gonna put them in the dry moat around London Tower. The artist's idea was to have real human hands place each of these poppies and there was going to be um, 888,246 of them 
one for each Commonwealth soldier who died in the Great War. So it was a commemoration of World War I because we were coming up to the anniversary, the um, century anniversary for that. And so William, Kate, and Harry were there for that. And he says that it was just mentally dislodging to see this visualization of death itself. And he felt stricken for all the lives and for all those family. But then, of course, the real reason he was upset wasn't about all those poppies, but because it was three weeks before the anniversary of Mummy's death. So it seems like a weird thing to come, like, to even note. Like, everything in your life, you're always being like, oh, it's so many weeks until Mummy's death. Oh, it's this many days. Oh, it's this many hours. Oh, it's this many, you know, it's just like, you, you, you live your whole life around that date. This, you know, art installation is, it's not related to mommy's death. Like I don't, under, I, it just, it just seems super depressing to go through life and everything is spinning around mommy's death. Everything orbits around that. I don't understand how he could go on. Um, so that was an already depressing little ceremony became that much more depressing. But he says when they were there, who should come out and greet him, but General Danat, who had um, been the person who had sent Harry back to war, back to Afghanistan. But his previous private secretary had set up a meeting with him and General Danat, and General Danat's the one who said, hey, you should go back to school and become a helicopter pilot. So that's the connection here. Well, General Danat says, let's go into the tower and I'll give you a quick tour. So they go in, um, they're looking at everything. Of course, they go and see the crown jewels. Um, inside were the, the dazzling jewels, including the crown, the one that had been placed upon Granny's head at her 1953 coronation. He says that it looked heavy, it looked magical, and the more they stared, the brighter it got. Was that possible? And he goes on and on and on about the crown. And then he says, but all I could think in that moment was how tragic that it should remain locked up in this tower. What is this, like an analogy for his life that he... This beautiful thing has been locked up in the tower of the royal family. He says, yet another prisoner. But I mean, what else are you gonna do with a priceless crown? Wear it out in the streets? It's not really a very good analogy. Anyway, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like he just goes through life, just as like, how can I squeeze this moment for every bitter drop that it will give me? He's just constantly looking to be offended, constantly looking to draw lines to his offense, constantly trying to make connections um, for, for, for all his uh, pain points. He, he wants to poke at them and prick them and make them bleed again. Of all the things that he struggles with in his mental health, I think that that to me is the most jarring of them all, that he would continually pick off the scab of his wounds. And for what purpose? to feel pain, he seems to, he seems to relish and to love the sensation of marinating in grief. And that I think is one of his um, more startling struggles with mental health. His panic attacks to me are nothing, uh, not nothing, but they are not to me indicative of what would be most appalling to me in this book. He continually points back to his panic attacks. That to him is like the, like if he could get that solved then everything else would be but i'm like let's dig in more into the area of you loving to, to hurt yourself let's talk about that anyway um then he goes on to talk about the invictus game so of course remember he's been plotting all the low these many years about how he's going to create something in england to answer back to the american warrior games he loved that whole idea so now he's coming up with a british version and so he is finally pulling these together he's naming them the invictus games he says that he um, named them after the William Ernest Henley poem. He says, every Brit knew that poem. Many had the first line by heart, out of the night that covers me. And what schoolboy or schoolgirl didn't encounter at least once those sonorous final lines? I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I think, I think the tragedy for Harry is that he thinks that that's a possibility in life, to be the master of his fate, to be the captain of his soul. But how many of us really are the master of our fate and the captain of our soul? I would say none of us, because you can't predict what's gonna happen in life. And, and, and like statements like that are so rousing 
because it gives us this false sense of the uh, of our of our own ability in life to manipulate everything around us so that we never have to be surprised and that's not reality it's not we can do everything right and we can line everything up exactly the way we want it and it can still just blow up in our face and to and i think that that's that's why harry is so flabbergasted by life but he still thinks it's a possibility. So he's just, his whole life, I think he's just trying to figure out like, at what point is he gonna find, finally feel like he is the master of his fate and the captain of his soul? And when he finally scrabbles onto that plateau, then finally he will have arrived once he's reached that height. Okay, so he talks about um, how the first games went. He says that he had to give a speech at the beginning and he was really, really nervous. And uh, he says that just as he was about to go on stage, the stupid producer came up and told him as he was rocking, walking on stage that they were running behind. And he was really annoyed by the fact that the guy would even tell him that. Cause he's like, oh, great, something else to think about, thanks. But it's like, you're the guy in charge. You'd be the one to, to be told, hey, we're kind of running late on, on things here. You know, we might need to speed this up. We're running behind time. But I guess it was with those words echoing in his mind that he gets up to give his speech and kind of rushes through it. At least in his mind, he did. I go back and watch the speech. I really just can't be bothered, but that's what he says. And then, of course, he says that he sat back down next to Pa. And Pa says, well done, darling boy. And of course, Harry has to be like, oh, disingenuous. I mean, I didn't do good, so he just said that. Well, maybe you did better than you thought. You know, everybody, anytime you do any public speaking, generally, you end up getting off stage and thinking, oh, like I should have done this differently. I should have done this differently. I wish I would have, uh, you know, slowed this part down. I should have, you know, I shouldn't have gone on so long about that. Everybody pick, you know, who doesn't pick themselves apart or gets off stage and thinks, what did I say again? I can't even remember what I just said. So of course he's going to be down on himself. By his very nature, he's down on himself. Then Pa tries to say an encouraging word. He won't even hear it. Then he tells us a little ditty about how, um, how he had met this man and woman also at the closing ceremonies and they had their young daughter between them and he says that the daughter was wearing a pink hoodie and orange ear defenders he says she said probably at the prompting of the grown-ups thank you for making my daddy daddy again i don't know of a child would say that but anyway her dad had won a gold medal and you know um there was just one problem with this whole scenario. She was too short to see the Foo Fighters. So then Harry put her on his shoulders and they, you know, all the four of them watched and danced and sang and celebrated being alive. And it was his 30th birthday. And you know, that's how he spent it. I don't know. Um, then he says that it was at this time that he had to make the official announcement that he was no longer in the army. Did any of us think he was? Um, but he and Elf, his private secretary, had um, been writing up a draft of what he was gonna say. And it was real hard for him to figure out how to say it because, you know, he wasn't even really sure why he was leaving the army. Well, I know why you're leaving. You weren't doing anything with them. But it was time now to become an official royal. So he says that he was coming out and he made his little speech and it was just real hard for him because he's like, how do I stop being something that it's all I ever wanted to be? A soldier, you know. And he says that it was just a time of mental anguish and mental crisis. But then he happened to see a soldier who he had known or who he had met when he was flying back from Afghanistan that last time. I think he had like lost a leg. Anyway, one day he was just walking the streets of London and who should he see but this guy that he'd known in Afghanistan. And the guy had uh, was running a marathon, not the London marathon, but his own marathon. He'd marked out this path he wanted to take and here he was running this marathon just to prove to himself he could do it and Harry found this incredibly inspiring and he said that seeing him out there still being a soldier despite no longer being a soldier that was the answer to the riddle which I'd been struggling for with so long how do you stop being a soldier when a soldier is all you've ever wanted to be well you don't even when you stop being a soldier you don't have to stop being a soldier ever but what's the sacrifice here for him. Like being a soldier, the very definition of a soldier implies in its being that you are giving something up for a greater thing. 
you're putting your life on the line, your safety on the line for an ideal. But how exactly does Harry plan on espousing those same virtues? Like this guy has to soldier on with his one leg, you know, and, and hit the way he's going through life proving that he still has great determination and perseverance is to set out this marathon course for himself and run it without a leg. But how does Harry as a royal with a lot of duties and like a very clear course set out for himself, I mean, is there really all that much sacrifice put into that? I mean, I know it's probably not all that fun to go and, and do a lot of these events and you always have to be on and I'm sure <clears throat> that there's some part of that that's quite wearying. But I just feel like he, he just is a little bit dramatic. And I, I mean, that is, that's nothing new. We've seen that many's the time. Throughout this whole book, just the way he looks at life, it's like he's just watched too many TV shows and it's informed him, well, too many movies. He's just, it, it, and it's informed him about how you react to the world. This whole book is just so dramatic. You know, side note, I've often wondered who people would be if there wasn't any TV to tell them who they were supposed to be. It's, which is why we, I don't let my children watch TV because I wanted to find out who they are. I don't want to watch some Disney character. Anyway, um, okay. Now he goes on to this long jag. Now that he's told you that he is a working royal. Okay, and this is where the story starts to pick up. So if you're like, wow, this is really a lagging episode. Don't worry. Hang in there because he starts talking about how at the beginning of 2015 he goes on a list in a huge paragraph all the things he does that year okay so he's really setting you up to know he's a worker he's a doer okay but and he's like and by the way that's just the highlights that's just the, that wasn't even like you know i'm not going to detail for you every little thing i was up to but i mean and it's quite quite a long list He follows that up right after he finishes telling you how awesome he is to let you know that the papers were awash with stories about how lazy Willie was. And he says that the press had taken to calling him work shy Wills. And he's like, it was just so obscene, grossly unfair because he was busy having children and raising a family. Kate was pregnant again. And this is really like, you guys, this is crazy how he goes from telling everything he's done to then talking about how Willie is being called lazy and he acts like he's shocked by it, but then he also follows it with this. He goes, also, by the way, <laughs> he was still beholden to Pa, who controlled the purse strings. He did as much as Pa wanted him to do, and sometimes that wasn't much, because Pa and Camilla didn't want Willie and Kate getting loads of publicity. Pa and Camilla didn't like Willie and Kate drawing attention away from them or their causes. They'd openly scolded Willie about it many times. And then he goes on to say, I'm just like, wait a second, why are you telling us that? That's not our business. And if you're so concerned with the media sharing stories about your family that they don't have any business sharing, why are you doing that? Oh my gosh. I mean, how many times, how many times can you complain about a leaker and you're leaking? He says, case in point, Pa's press officer berated Willie's team when Kate was scheduled to visit a tennis club at the same day that Pa was doing an engagement. Told that it was too late to cancel the visit, Pa's press officer warned, you make sure the Duchess doesn't hold a tennis racket in any of the photos. Such a winning, fetching photo would undoubtedly wipe Pa and Camille off the front pages, and that, in the end, could have tolerated. What are you talking about? Why in the world would any positive media attention to the royal family be a negative and a time in which people are questioning the legitimacy of continuing to have a royal family. Now, I like the royal family. I think it's a lovely institution. It's sort of fun to watch what they're doing. And it's a, you know, I, I don't have a problem with it. You Brits do what you want. But it just seems to me that at a time in which there's any negative, that there could be any negative vibe, why would you not try to get as much pre positive press coverage as you can by putting some of people's favorite royals out there doing things amongst the people. Everyone loves Catherine. Anyway, he says, Harry continues to talk on the subject. He's he not, not willing to let it go yet. He says, Willie told me that both he and Kate felt trapped 
and unfairly persecuted by the press and Pa and Camilla. So I felt some need to carry the banner for all three of us in 2015, which is why I was working so hard all the time. I had to work this hard. He says, selfishly, I didn't want the press coming from me. <laughs> to be called lazy? I shuddered. I never wanted to see that word attached to my name. The press had called me stupid for most of my life and naughty and racist. But if they dared to call me lazy, well, I couldn't guarantee I was going to go down to Fleet Street and start pulling people up from behind their desks. Okay, let's see you do it. Um, he said that it wasn't until later that he realized that the real reason the press was going after William was because William wouldn't play their game. He said that William had refused to trot Catherine out like some kind of a racehorse and the press was mad and trying to get back at him for it. And he says that William had had the temerity to give a vaguely anti-Brexit speech and that had galled them because he says Brexit was their bread and butter. And how dare William even suggest that not be all that it could be. I don't know. I mean, what? Like, can you imagine the life that Harry would have had if he had just let go of the idea that the whole media, the whole arm of the media was just poised to slap him? Okay. So then he moves on to saying that William and Catherine had their second child, Charlotte. And he says that Charlotte was just yet one more joy in his life. He was so happy to be an uncle yet again. But the stupid press once again had to interview him. And here we get the same story that he already told us about George when George was born. We've already had this story, Harry. You've already told us about the, how they're always questioning about your feelings with the line of secession. Like, as his editor, I would have said, all right, well, we've already done this story. You don't have to, like, every new kid retell us this story. So I'm going to... I'm jumping right past that. I, I can't even with that. We already know how you feel about it. Um, but he does say that in that same interview, they were asking him, like, when's he going to get his act together and get married? <clears throat> and that he claims that the journalist said, well, everyone thinks that you're just, you know, a male version of Bridget Jones. And so he's all, like, annoyed with that. And he said that they pitied him and said, well, when are you going to get a wife? And he had said, you know, it'll happen when it happens. And he says the journalist told him, hmm, will it, though? say that nobody's that rude well maybe Barbara Walters back in the day she's pretty rude but I don't think a modern journalist would ask you and sort of like pityingly say to you hmm will it though when asking about like when are you planning on getting married kind of a rude question in the first place but even if they had asked that I don't think they would have pityingly said will you though come on get out of here with that okay now, these are the tales of his normalcy, okay? So in case, lest you ever think that he was too big for his britches and thought too much of himself, he just wants to put those crazy ideas to rest because he wants to let you know that he was super normal, you guys. Totally and completely just your average Joe. Then he goes on to tell me some stories where I'm just like, at 30 years old, this isn't the way you should be behaving. Everyone thought his life was so glamorous, being a prince, but it wasn't, okay, at all. And he says that he did his own laundry. Um, often he just laid out his clothes on the radiators to dry. He was, that's because that's what normal people do. And he said he did all his own chores and his own cooking and his own food shopping. And he said that there was a supermarket by the palace and he went there casually at least once a week. He says, of course, he had to plan these trips very carefully as though he were going into battle. And he said that he had arrived at different times randomly to throw off the press. He'd wear a disguise, a low baseball cap, sometimes a big coat. What disguises are these? He said that he'd travel those aisles at warp speed and he'd memorize the store. Like he had, a, he had a map of it in his head, like the rest of us don't. And he says, you know, he'd get his, his salmon fillets and his yogurt and his Granny Smith apples and his bananas, of course, some potato chips. And then he'd get out of there. But then one time he went to the grocery store and it was laid out differently. Everything was different and, and it wasn't the way he had ever known it. And he went up to an employee pleadingly, beseeching them to explain to him what in the world had happened to the grocery store. He had the map and now the map was of no use to him and he's got to get in and out, okay? In and out. And as it turns out, 
at grocery stores, they will rearrange things so you don't know where things are and then you'll stay in longer and buy more things. No, actually, I didn't know that was true. It really makes sense because I have sometimes wondered, hey, you guys, why are you switching things up? <laughs> but now I know. Well, thanks, Harry. I did learn something. Oh, well, anyway, he was, he says he was gobsmacked. You can do that by law? Yes, Harry, a lot of things are, by, are okay. Okay, even though you didn't know about it. So he was just in a panic, just in a panic. And you know, the worst part being at the grocery store was when you had to come up and check out. And right there are all of the tabloid magazines with his face, his mom's face, his brother's face. The whole family's just splashed across the tabloids day in and day out. He says that sometimes he'd have to stand there and listen to him talking about him as they leaf through the magazines waiting for their time to check out. And a lot of times he just wanted to tap them on the shoulder and be like, hey, you're over there discussing if I'm happy, if I, when I'm gonna get married, if I'm gay. And I'm here to tell you, hello, <laughs> right here, I can hear ya. Um, he says he had not unveiled himself though to any of these gossipy old nags until one day when he was at the store. And you guys, listen, he was a hero. So just, you know, uh, if you ever thought that he wasn't just all that a man could be, just listen to the way he stands up for this cashier. He writes, one night in disguise, watching some people discuss me and my life choices, I became aware of raised voices at the front of the queue. An older married couple abusing the cashier. <laughs> what? It was unpleasant at first, then intolerable. I stepped forward, showed my face, and I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Excuse me, not sure what's going on here, but I don't think that you should be speaking to her like that. The cashier was on the verge of tears. The couple abusing her turned and recognized me, and they weren't in the least surprised. However, they were just offended to be called out in their abuse. First of all, they should have been surprised. When they left, when it came to my turn to pay, the cashier tried to thank me as she bagged my avocados, but I wouldn't hear of it. Mm -mm, no, no, no. I told her, you hang in there, okay? And then I scooped up my things and I ran like the Green Hornet. Okay. So you were a decent human being? Is that worthy of your memoir? Who among us would see somebody just berating somebody, and, like would just let it go? Like if it was getting to the point where the person's crying and and they're just going on and on. Like, who among us would just stand there and be like, ooh, well, I'm not gonna get involved. Wouldn't you say something? I, I mean, I would. I would if somebody is like being berated and the poor cashier is just like almost in tears and the people just keep going on and on and on. I would say something. And then when I was done, I of course would speak to the cashier and just be like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I hope you have a better day. Like, who wouldn't do that? There's just absolutely no reason why that this story should have come in the book. Because if you did do that, that's great, but that's, that's part of being a decent human being in the world. Because he goes on to say that the problem with the media was that they didn't act as though common decency and kindness, like that was something extra. And he's like, I never viewed it that way. I thought kindness, kindness and decency was the least we could offer each other. Okay, well then if it is, why are you telling us about when you were just kind and decent? Okay. Now he says that um, he gives us a long litany on how he loved to bargain shop for clothes. I don't know, you guys. Um, he says as a rule, he didn't think about clothing. And because first of all, he just fundamentally didn't even believe in the idea of fashion. And he didn't really get why anybody else did. And he said he was often mocked on social media for his mismatched clothes and his ratty shoes. And writers would flag a photo of him and wonder why his trousers were so long or his shirts were so crumpled. But here's the thing, they were crumpled because he dried them on the radiator. So that's why. They would have said it wasn't very princely of him. But you guys, this is how I feel about what this whole passage. Okay, I think it was, it was given to us to remind everybody that he's just super normal. But you know what? Why does being sloppy mean you're normal? See, I have this whole thing about celebrities who dress in rags and rich people who try to act like, you know, they're above caring about clothes. But this is the thing, when you dress well, when you take care of yourself, when you iron your shirt, that is not only respectful to everybody around you who has to deal with you, but also like respect for yourself. Like why are you not worth the effort it would take to iron your shirt? 
And why are you not worth the effort of getting your pants hem so that they fit and they're not dragging on the floor and like ratty and tattered? Why are you not worth the effort of coming into the into a room put together? Harry's indifference towards how he looks like on the outside with his clothes, it's kind of a reflection on how he feels about himself on the inside. Like he's not worth the effort. And I think that's really sad that he would feel that he's not worth the effort of dressing in clothes that fit or that are flattering or that are ironed or that he's not, you know, combing his hair and being neat. Like, I feel like it's almost more of a reflection of his like mental illness. Cause when, when somebody begins to be depressed, that's like hand in glove with it. They stop taking care of their appearance. They stop showering. They stop presenting themselves well because it's just a reflection of how they feel already about themselves and their circumstances. And so I just don't understand why he would think that this makes him more normal. I think it's only, I mean, it, I guess in some sense, there's a lot of people who just sort of muck around in their sweats and they go to the store and they're, uh, you know, in their slippers and, you know, they just don't care about their appearance. And I think the message that people are trying to put forth is I don't need people's approval so I can go into the world looking however. That's fine if you don't need people's approval. That's great because you shouldn't be living your whole life waiting for other people to approve of you or you'll always be running after everybody's, uh, you know, love and adoration, which very, very rarely you're going to have everybody's love and adoration. But what it says more is me as you're trying to say, hey, look how much I don't care. What it really says is look how much I don't care about myself because I'm not even worth the effort that it would take to dress myself and to comb my hair and to go into the world looking like I have a, a sense of worth. Anyway, that's just my tangent there. But anyway, he wants you to let, he just wants you to know he just didn't care and he was super normal. He says that his dad had given him this gorgeous pair of black brogues and they were awesome. He wore them until they had holes in the soles and you know, he just kept on wearing them. But then he said everybody started making fun of him. So then he like, Took him to a cobbler. If you have to wait for everybody to make fun of you before you're like, I guess I should go get my shoes cobbled. Like that doesn't even make any sense. Like your dad gave you this great pair of shoes. Take care of them. Take care of your things. I don't understand. Everybody's so mean to him all the time and they drove him into the arms of the cobbler. But shouldn't you have already been driven into the arms of the cobbler? Your, your shoes are, are full of holes, but they're nice shoes and you get them fixed. I don't get him. But then he goes on to say that Pa gave him an official clothing allowance, but that was just for formal clothes and ties and ceremonial outfits. So he was on his own when it came to finding his own clothes and like paying for his own clothes. And he, for his everyday casual clothes, he liked to go to TK Maxx. Now that's in the UK, it's TK Maxx in Europe and stuff, but in the United States, it's TJ Maxx in case you don't know. Anyway, so he goes to the discount store and he says he was particularly fond of their once in a year sale when they be flush with items from Gap and J. Crew, and that, you know, had just gone out of season or they were slightly damaged. And if you timed it just right and you got there the first day of the sale, you could snag the same clothes that others were paying top prices for down on the high street. With 200 quid, you could look like a fashion plate. And he says that he would go to the store 15 minutes before closing time, grab a red bucket and then hurry to the top floor and begin systematically working one rack from up one rack and down another. And he says that Billy the Rock, his bodyguard, was real delighted in moonlighting as his stylist. And then he'd leave with two giant shopping bags and he wouldn't have to think about uh, doing laundry or his clothes for six months. I just don't even know about that passage. Like, I mean, I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it is like normal of you to go shop at TJ Maxx. I mean, who, who among us doesn't from time to time, but I don't know. Like, it's just kind of depressing to me. Him just sort of like living his old life and like, you know, getting his old discount clothes and like, I just don't know why he's living like this, driving his clothes on, on the radiator and like eating over the sink. And I, I don't know, but I just feel like real down about this whole passage. But then he says that the little uh, going out that he had been doing in 2014, he quit that entirely. And he says that in 2015, he just, he stopped leaving the house. He just wouldn't go. He didn't even go to the store. I mean, sometimes he would, but he'd gotten Pa's chef to start cooking for him. And so the chef would, you know, pack his fridge with cottage pies and chicken pies. And he was grateful to not have to leave the house quite as often to go get his food. But the problem is, is that when he'd eat this bland British food, it would make him think of the Gurkhas and their spicy stews. And that just made him miss the Gurkhas and the war and the army. Always seeing the negative to a positive. Hey, fella, you got your fridge stocked. But now you have to complain that it wasn't spicy enough because then it made you think of the Gurkhas. Like, 
what why is that where your mind goes day in and day out and then he says after dinner he'd smoke some weed and then he'd turn in early solitary life that's what he says he felt lonely but it was better than feeling panicky and he had become an agoraphobic i mean that's what he says i don't know he says it was kind of impossible to really commit to the whole agoraphobic shtick because he still had to go out and give a bunch of dumb speeches and he says that at one point after one speech um that couldn't be avoided or count that couldn't be avoided or canceled and in which he had almost fainted willie came up to him afterwards and says to him laughing harold look at you you're drenched and he couldn't even fathom this reaction that William was having because by the way, his first panic attack that he'd ever had was with him and Kate. He'd been in the back seat of the Range Rover after a polo match and they had to drive ages and he was in the back seat drenched in sweat. His face was bright red. He couldn't breathe. And he says that William had looked at him in the rearview mirror and said, you are right, Harold. No, I wasn't. It was a trip of several hours and every few miles I wanted to ask him to pull over so I could jump out and try to catch my breath. But here's the thing, Harry, did you ask him? Did you say, I've got, you've got to stop. You've got to stop the car. I, I can't breathe. Like, did, did you raise the alarm or did you just look like you were hot in the back seat? He says William knew what was going on, but he doesn't say he told William what was going on. So how do we know that William did know? Anyway, he says that after that, well, he says, William knew that something was up. Okay, so William surmised, he sorted out that something wasn't right, though you did not tell him. Okay, so he vaguely knew that you didn't feel good. And he says, uh, he says he knew something was up, something bad. He told me that day or soon after that I needed help. And now he was teasing me? I couldn't imagine how he could be so insensitive. I'm having a panic attack and you're over here laughing at my whole sweaty face. How dare you? But he says, he goes, but I was at fault too. Well, actually, both of us were. He literally says that I was at fault, but actually both of us were. Um, because we should have known better. We should have recognized my crumbling emotional and mental states for what they were. We just started to discuss the launching of a public campaign to raise awareness around mental health. So what was wrong with us for not taking my panic attacks more seriously? But Harry, you've been having panic, panic attacks for ages and you haven't gone to see a doctor about them. So, I mean, is it is it William's fault for not also taking it seriously? Okay, and then this is our last little story. He says that he had gone to commemorate the 150th anniversary of this uh, hospital called Mild May Mission Hospital, which happened to be the same one where his mother had taken the famous picture of, his, of her... Um, holding the hand of an HIV positive man and had really helped to stop the stereotype that HIV was going to kill you if you even got within, you know, a hundred miles of it. And, <clears throat> and that people with it were just a danger to society. So she had proved that the disease didn't disqualify people from love or dignity. She reminded the world that respect and compassion aren't gifts, they're the least that we owe each other. So he had come to the hospital for their 150 year anniversary of being open and aiding people. And he says that while he was there, he found out that his mummy actually had come quite a few times to the hospital, not making a big deal of it. She'd just slip in and see some of the patients and talk to the young little kids who'd been born with it. And he says that he met a woman there who says that the woman remembered sitting on mummy's lap. She says she was only two at the time, but she had remembered it. And my face flushed. I felt such envy. Did you? Says Harry. I did, I did, and oh, it was so nice. She gave a great cuddle but I didn't remember. No matter how I tried, I barely remembered a thing. And that's where I started, that's where we end, but that's where I felt like genuinely sad for him. Because the thing is, is that he, he really does have such scraps of his mom and yet his entire life has been based on the negative space that she represents in his life. And I guess I just felt really um, just sad for him as a human being. Really, really sad for him. That his whole life has been built and orbits around a woman who isn't there anymore. 
And as we'll soon see in the next section, when he meets Megan, it made it so easy for her to come in and stand in that negative space and now be the one who he orbits around. He had such a gaping hole in his heart for his mother. And if he had learned, like William did, how to lovingly close that chapter and move on, boy, I think he could have avoided Megan altogether. But he just left that door wide open and stood in the house screaming, somebody, 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 somebody come in. Dude, it just stinks. It just stinks to see somebody's life, like, just come to nothing. And I wouldn't say that it's coming to nothing, but boy, I just hope that, like, I hope that we have the privilege of seeing him come to his senses. Can you imagine the joy that that would be? Like, I would feel genuine joy for him as a, as a human being. If we got to see the arc of this, that this was not his, this was not the peak of when we know him, that his peak is coming. You know, I would, I would rejoice for him to see a, a like a change and a, an awakening and, and like a rebirth for him. That, that all of this stuff that has come up is, is not the end for him. And that, that the, the South Park episode and all of this where it's just like, can you imagine how badly he feels right now? And we laugh and we joke and we think it's hilarious. And the thing is, is that it's so easy to. And it's so easy to make fun of him. And it's so easy to laugh at him. He makes it so easy. But man, he must be feeling bad. And if this person who could write this book, which is just such a pathetic account of every little um, petty and um, unimportant slight, if those things meant so much to him that he could write a book about it, where is he mentally right now when the entire world is like falling into each other's arms laughing at the South Park episode? I just like at a certain point, like when is it going to be enough for him <clears throat> to realize that whatever trajectory he's on, it's not working. But in the next section, we are going to, on the next video, we're going to end this second part. Cause you know how the book's divided into three parts. It's like his youth and then his like, before I'm married and then he meets Megan. So on the next video, we're gonna end part two, but then we're gonna go ahead and go right into part three because there's just not enough of part two um, to like make a whole video about it. So next episode, we should be meeting Megan. If not, he's on the verge of meeting Megan. So stay tuned for that. Oh wow, this was a really long video, um, but it was great seeing you. I hope you have a lovely weekend, great Friday, and I will see you, I should see you on Sunday. So, bye y'all.